Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey, I'm gonna bring up special guest I haven't had in a while. Mr. Hat. Let's go. I just, I get, an, I take on a new persona when I put the hat on. Merichrism. Let's go. Original link to the video, top of the description. If you are not, I said, if you're not ready to learn, there's the door, right? Didn't I say that? If not, get out. Okay. Go. Oh, yeah. That's a fine look at... Don't! Oh! Okay, no big deal. Uh, uh. Ah, stupid... Navy. <laughs> you gotta build fast. The Americans are coming. Uh, yeah. Damn right, brother. One fine looking... Tank. Why doesn't mine look like that? Why? Ah, why? Why must life be so hard? How's your father's project coming along? I think he's almost done. <laughs> yeah, he's done. Japanese tanks. Uh, I, Japan. I, obviously, they have to go through through Manchuria and, and go through China. And I, I'm not sure exactly how difficult it is to transport tanks. Um, I know today they can do it. I think even some helicopters can. If not, there are some, definitely some planes that, that can carry tanks. But back then, I'm assuming it was done by boat, uh, mostly. And Japan was a completely offensive war until the very end. Um, and I, I, I just don't see... Like, when I think of a, a, a nation with a lot of tanks, I just, I just don't think of uh, Imperial Japan. So, I'm interested. It's reviewed as a meme. Believe me, I know. Just go read the comments on the Hago video. Bars! And given their performance at Konk and Gaul and against the Americans, it's understandable how they got this stigma and how it seeped into the popular consensus. But I think this doesn't take everything into account and is sort of unfair to the designers. So here's a brief overview of Japanese tanks. Yeah. Like almost all countries after World War I, Japan witnessed what modern warfare had become over those four years and wanted to catch up in three major areas, tanks, planes, and radio communication. On the tank side, they did what just about everyone else did and imported foreign models post-war to test. These included a British Mark IV, a handful of Whippets, and a few orders of FT-7. To me, the British ones I know are the oldest the and, and probably the least reliable, but seeing that, especially in World War I, would just be so terrifying. A any tank would be terrifying, but this one especially. I know it had a lot of problems. These included a British Mark IV, a handful of Whippets, and a few orders of FT-17s. As these tanks arrived, Japanese Minister of War, this guy whose name I can't pronounce, embarked I, I'll on- I'll do it. As these tanks arrived, Japanese Minister of War, this- Kazushigi Visaki? This guy whose name I can't pronounce, embarked on an overall program of demobilization with the goal of quality over quantity in mind taking a few divisions and remaking them into the 1st Japanese Tank Battalion on May 1st, 1925. This, though, received a lot of pushback from other branches and even the army itself due to the culture of the Japanese army. One thing needed to understand Japanese tank development and the country's military actions as a whole is the fierce competition between the branches. The Navy was always fighting with the army, and for most of the war, more traditional generals in the army fought the newer ones on this whole concept of mechanization, which they saw as a waste of time. Ugaki, however, pressed on. Once the Japanese had worked enough with the foreign models, they decided it was time to develop one domestically. And this task fell to Tomi Ohara, head of the new army. Before we go to that, uh, am, am I the only one who sees a lot of similarities between Japan and the UK? Uh, geographically, I, I'm talking about. Um, like, the, they, like the, the UK seems like the Japan of Europe and, and Japan seems like the UK of Asia. Just kind of being very close to the Asian continent, but separated because you're an island nation and not having that many resources on your island. And so having to go get them yourself and needing a very strong navy to do that. And yeah, I, I see that. I also bring this on a lot. Again, on this channel, if you've seen um, uh, my my many reaction videos i'm sure i've done a good amount by now on um imperial japan and world war ii 
of course, we t talked about the atrocities they committed and whatnot, and so I'd like to, you know, progress and 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 that that shouldn't really need to be on this channel. I don't think that Nazi atrocities or or when talking about World War II or Japanese atrocities, like that, that's just it goes without saying those things. And so we, I, I like to dissect uh, how countries worked and what they did without that always penetrating into the conversation because we're not talking about morality we're talking about history history what was i talking about i had a, such a good point right um and and so i just think the meiji restoration meiji meiji um it, japan was just so impressive how they went from china to um later on um but japan just how they went from Admiral Perry, I think it was, forget his first name, uh, the American guy who, who had him open their doors to outside trade and and being them and China. I'm, I'm going long. Fast forward if you want to get to the video, but I, I, I feel like talking about this. And um, China, too, just getting bullied and um, incapable to... Uh, rise up against the military strength of these European great powers. And finally, with the Russo-Japanese War, th that giant victory where the uh, first time where an, an Eastern power defeated a Western one, a major Western one in Russia, and then how they just turned, turned it around to become so well-industrialized and technologically advanced. And even past World War II, you know, into technology, and, and they have just such a booming economy. I just find Japan as such an impressive, intelligent country. Adaptable. Bureau. This developed one domestically, and this task fell to Tomio Hara, yeah, yeah, head I of the new Army Technical Bureau. This, though, was going to be quite a task as Japanese industry had at this point only produced trucks and some small tractors. The first model was experimental tank number one which was deemed too large and yeah. slow, but proved Hara's capability, although it was never mass produced. The second model that was deemed to be sufficient was the first mass produced diesel power tank in the world. I, I missed that. Which was deemed Stop. trucks and some small tractors. The first model was experimental tank number one, which was deemed too large and slow, but proved Hara's capability, although it was never mass produced. The second model that was deemed to be sufficient was the first mass produced diesel power tank in the world. The Type 89. Small side note about Japanese tank designations. The Japanese calendar, which they used at the time, began in 660 BCE upon the founding of the country. So, for example, the Type 89 tank was introduced in 1929, which was the year 2589 in their calendar. Guys, why does it seem like every other country, or it seems like German tanks in World War II, were the only ones to have these very long muzzles on their main gun? like three times the length of the other with, with the big, these long barrels, sorry, with the big muzzle flash mu or whatever at the end of it. It just looks so intimidating, but I, I, would, I would assume that would provide more accuracy with a longer barrel, right? And so why, why weren't other ones? All, it seems like today's model tanks, you know, modern tanks all seem to follow that long big barrel with that, I'm not, what's that thing at the end, like the, at the end of the barrel? It kind of has two ejection sides that the bullet doesn't go out. That kind of the fumes, I guess, do. Um, yeah, why why don't other tanks do that? Other countries. And they use the last two numbers of the year in the name. There was also a method to naming the tanks once multiple vehicles began being developed in the same year, beginning with a designation for its role, such as Chi for medium tanks and the Chi Ha or Ho for SPGs like the Ho Ro and so on. I'll link something in the description that goes into more detail if you're interested. There was, however, a big question. How to use these tanks that at the time of the early to mid-30s were very capable in their design, but had no doctrine yet. And the same question that was being bickered over in Europe arose. Should they support the infantry or be used as their own arm in a combined force? You know, the whole Britain v France, which war theory is better thing. Now, although this answer is obvious now, it was not back then. The European countries had only been able to test their theories in war games so far, and the topic was equally contentious in Japan. But in 1933, they seemed to have found an answer. Why is seeing tanks run over stuff just so satisfying? 
After initial gains into Manchuria, the Japanese force began to advance further into China proper in the Battle of Rihi. With the Chinese warlord's troops on the run, General Yoshikazu Nishi decided to pursue the chase with mechanized infantry to great effect by exploiting a breakthrough down the Jinzhou Zhaoyang Highway, disrupting Chinese defenses ahead of the main Japanese force. Sound familiar? This among another handful of effect by exploiting a breakthrough down the Jinzhou Zhaoyang Highway, disrupting Chinese defenses ahead of the main Japanese force. Sound familiar? Is he talking about Dunkirk or Battle of the... Okay. This, among another handful of uses of tanks, showed their usefulness in or a combined arms assault. the first German assault. offensive through the Ardennes. Oh. This vindicated Japanese I, I gotta shut uses up. of tanks showed their usefulness in a combined arms assault. This vindicated Japanese generals in favor of the tank, with the independent mixed brigade being created, and also adding the Type 95 Hago, the Japanese equivalent to the 7-ton infantry tanks being produced all over Europe, to their arsenal in 1936 after previous development starting in 1934. These lessons, however, were utterly ignored in 1937 under Tojo, who decided to spread out the armored force in a more infantry-centered attack plan. This change in tactics proved especially poor at battles like Xinkao against central Chinese army forces with proper anti-tank guns, who found the thinly spread Japanese tanks as easy and rare targets. Because of this, the Japanese high command decided that combined arms doctrine was a failure, thinking of 1937 and not 1933. Because of this, the Independent Mixed Brigade was effectively disbanded, although tank production and development continued, with much of its resources being diverted to other branches. Due to this, tank development and increased production became more difficult and was mostly put on the back burner until two major things happened almost simultaneously. The first was Nomahan, where the Japanese got a very bloody nose from the Soviets showing the weakness of their armored force against a combined arms force behind Zhukov, and second, the effective use of combined arms tactics being used by the Germans to great effect in Europe that the Japanese had a front row seat to through the eyes of those sent to sign the arms force behind Zhukov, and second, the effective use of combined arms tactics being used by the Germans to great effect in Europe that the Japanese had a front row combined armed tactics meaning air force going in to bombard artillery tanks going around to to engulf troops and then the infantry going in to sweep up like just that that just means like using air force different parts of the military in in one Organized manner is seat to through the eyes of those sent to sign the Axis Pact. This Europe that the Japanese had a front row seat to through the eyes of those sent to sign the Axis Pact. This prompted the Japanese High Command to reevaluate their stance, forming the mechanization headquarters to develop mechanized units and tactics. This, however, was too little too late as with the upcoming drive into Southeast Asia and the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Chinese front bogging down into a stalemate, the Navy, the Army's rival, had received production priority, making the creation of new and better tanks impractical and nearly impossible as the Japanese Army would be island hopping for the foreseeable future, and more ships and easily transportable light tanks would be needed. Hara was not completely done, though. Upgrades to the Type 97 were made to make it more capable in an anti-tank role, resulting in the Chiakai. And during the Burma campaign, the British would comment on the effectiveness of Japanese tank movements through the jungle, taking them by surprise with large mechanized attacks. What is it with the Axis and going through forests? Japanese tanks were also used to great effect in the Philippines in 1941. But surprise. overall, the sun had set on the Japanese tank project, with them using models that were years outdated for the duration of the war that paled in comparison to the Sherman, the main battle tank that the Japanese ran into from this point on. And this is the real reason Japanese tanks are seen as so bad. The point in the war where they are outdated and used sparingly is the point that, at least in the West, is given the most attention. And looking at this point, the Japanese look like they simply don't know how to design a tank. But in reality, the forces behind the curtain misread the situation entirely in the 30s, back when Japanese tanks were very capable, and came around, to the arguably more correct point of view, far too late to breathe life back into the Japanese tank program and set up new lines of production and develop new designs. There were a handful of more capable designs made later in the war, mostly ones stretching the Type 97 hull to its limits, that would have been more effective, but were retained for the defense of the potential invasion of the home islands and never saw service. So hopefully this video clears up some of the questions as to why Japanese tanks were so ineffective. There's a lot more on this topic, but I figured I'd cut it off here before it goes on for too long. For more info, I can't recommend Steven Zaloga's books enough. He covers everything in a very concise and interesting way, and I'll link them below. 
Also, for more information on the Hago specifically, check out the video I did on it, and I plan to release a similar one on the Type 97 too. If you live anywhere in the Midwest and you would like to see some of these Japanese tanks up close, I implore you. Are there tank museums where you can go inside the tank? ...to go visit the Indiana Military Museum, who has both a Type 95 and Type 97 on display. They're actually having a living history event that I plan to attend on Labor Day weekend, and they should have both tanks out for display at that time if you want to take a closer look, as well as running some of the other ones they own. You got a great channel, As always, man. I would like to thank my patrons on Patreon for their support. Making sure there are no promo codes. Awesome video. I... I you know, he was saying, well, hopefully that clears up some of the stuff around uh, Japanese tanks. I knew nothing about Japanese tanks going into this. Potential history. Awesome as always. Feels good to have the hat on again. Merry Christmas, guys. Happy December. See you next time.